Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for taking out of time out of your day to meet with us. I am super excited to welcome our friends from Omnia. Omnia Group has a wonderful system and program that can help you with managing your existing team, with recruiting candidates, even understanding yourself a bit better. It's a wonderful company that we are proud to partner with. From this day forward, you're going to be hearing a lot from Omnia. They're going to be doing several webinars, like the next one in April. You're all going to love it. It's going to be on remote team members, which I know is going to be something that's going to be very interesting to all of you. But today is all about mastering the Art and science of identifying top talent, and you are in for something special. Get ready to take a lot of notes. Don't worry, I'm recording this call. It will be hosted and posted on the platform. I'm also going to share it with the team from Omnia so they can share with their network. But get ready to take tons and tons of notes and ask great questions. But with that said, I want to pass it to my new friends, Kether and Wendy from Omnia Group. I am so thankful for our partnership and cannot wait to hear how you are able to help the agencies that we work with build and develop their teams. But with that said, I'm going to pass it to you, ladies. Great. Thank you so much, Joseph. And we are very excited as well to be joining in partnership with the Craig Wiggins Coaching and Consulting Practice and to meeting all of you on these webinars and out in the field. We'll be at the conference later this summer, too. So it's really exciting to get this kicked off. So I am Kether Snyder, the one speaking right now. I am the Chief Revenue Officer for the Omnia Group, which is a really big way of saying I, I basically lead the entire process of our client life cycle from demand generation all the way through to the delivery and fulfillment of everything we promise. So I lead marketing, sales, and customer success. And I am joined by the one who makes it all happen, Wendy Schaefer, our Chief Product Officer. So I'll let her introduce herself. Hello, everyone. Like Keller said, I'm Wendy Schaefer, Chief Product Officer. So I'm responsible for all of the reports that we deliver to our clients. And, you know, one of the things I love about assessments is the added insight that it provides to clients and such a, comp, you know, navigating human behavior and, and hiring and development and to have tools at your disposal to do that in a more organized fashion and have data points to make better decisions. It's just super exciting to me. So thank you for joining today. Thanks, Wendy. So here's what we're going to cover today. We are going to first just talk about why do you want to spend more time thinking about the art and science of hiring and mastering it. And we're going to start because of the cost factor. So we're going to talk about the cost and consequences to your agencies when you hire the wrong person. And then we're going to talk about the barriers, what gets in the way of hiring top talent. Uh, and then we're going to get into the magic sauce about what we do. And that is, how do you use personality traits to make sure you get great hires? And then we'll cover some other uh, significant best practices that we've learned along the way and we've helped our clients implement to really make sure you are tight on your entire process end to end. So that's what we'll cover. As Joseph said, we've got uh, questions you can ask in the chat. We want to make this interactive. We'll also take questions at the end. Uh, so we look forward to hearing from you. And we really want to start right off uh, hearing from you. So we're going to do a poll. Uh, we've got two questions for you to get started. And we like to ask our clients these same questions all the time. And then we collect this data and we always publish it uh, on a regular basis. So thank you for being part of, of our input. We would like to know, first of all, what kind of career development processes does your organization have? No process at all, somewhat random, informal, casual, or more formal. So thanks for jumping right in there. Looks like from a career development perspective, we got a lot of informal, more casual, and that is very common in smaller agencies and organizations. And um, there's nothing wrong with informal and casual. Uh, good to see, though, we've also got some formal aspect. I think whatever it is, you want to do something. So for those of you who have no process whatsoever, we hope you'll continue to join us and we'll be sharing tips and ideas throughout this today and also down the road about how to start thinking about more ways to proactively go after managing career development. All right, let's go to the next question, which is how often do employees move to different roles within your agencies? Always, sometimes, never. Again, thanks for jumping right in there. Looks like sometimes it is happening. We're up there in 70, 80%. So that's great. Career development and moving talent within 
go hand in hand. And when we're talking about trying to find talent, sometimes the best candidates for a position are the ones you already have, who know your clients, who know your agency. So great to see that many of you are already looking within. That would be one of our recommendations. For those of you who said never, might be something to consider if you're looking to uh, put uh, some or fill some uh, empty seats right now. We'll just suggest you look at that. So thanks, Joseph, for managing that poll. I'll close out of that. All right, so let's talk about what does a bad hire cost? The US Department of Labor, and I look at this study all the time because it seems high. So I validate it every time I use this reference point. And the Department of Labor does say that the average cost of a bad hire is about 30% of the first year's hire. Now we know that your average agency turns over 30 to 50% of their staff every single year. So this is money we are letting just walk out the door. What makes up that 30%? It's hard hiring costs like placing the ads, uh, making, uh, spending the money uh, on LinkedIn or Indeed or where you're trying to find those recruiters sometimes for really high level positions. Those are hard costs. There are also soft costs though. If you think about the time, our, our time to interview a leader's role in the hiring process or your employee's time and also lost productivity uh, with the seat that's empty. You could be losing money every day if you got a producer or sales role that isn't filled or you could be losing money by the productivity again of the people that are having to get involved in that hiring or onboarding process. So any way you slice it, it's expensive. So you really want to make sure you get it right the first time. So why does it happen? Why do people leave? Harvard Business Review publishes its data every single year, and they say that 80% of turnover does come down to bad hiring decisions. And really, it's on the part of us. It's on the part of the hiring managers who are making these decisions. Why does it happen? Uh, mis misunderstanding or just getting it wrong that the person can actually do the job or wants to do the job. Sometimes you think you got the right person and they came in and they are overwhelmed or they can't quite do the job that you need them to do. It also can come down to culture fit or just not having a fit with the manager and the person that's hired. So lots of things play into turnover. And the good news is you can address a lot of that if you've got a strong hiring process and you're using art and science. So here's what happens. We've all seen it, right? Especially when you're hiring salespeople and customer service people who are naturally people oriented. They show up on interview day and they look like Superman or Superwoman, right? They woo us with their personal skills and they show us all the things that they've done in the past and they're great at telling their story. And then what happens? You get them on board, maybe it's honeymoon for a bit, but after about two or three months, have you seen this happen? It's like, who hired this person? And this is reality. I love this visual that Wendy picked because look at the looks on the faces of the people having to work with this person. Again, a bad hire takes a toll on everyone in the organization. The people that had to spend time interviewing, the people that had to spend time onboarding this person, and it comes down to the fact that they just can't do the job. So what does it take to be a good hire? Well, a great hire has a lot of these qualities. They have the skills and the desire. And I just finished a great book called Traction that I'd highly recommend. And in the book, Gina Wickman, the author, says that when it comes to people, there has to be three factors that are at play here. The person has to get it, they have to want it, and they have to have the capacity to do it. Gino calls it in an acronym, the GWC. That's skills and desire. When you hire a person, you gotta make sure that they have the skill and the ability to do the job, and then they have to want to do the job. And then they have to have, obviously have to have the wherewithal to keep doing it day in and day out. And the good news is, is you can figure that out in the interview process if you take the time. The other key things though that make up a great hire is that you've got a personality fit, that the person is naturally wired to do the job that is needed to get done, that the person's will and motivations and the way they like to go about work, the way they like to problem solve, the way they like to communicate matches with the requirements of the job. And then finally, you wanna make sure there's culture fit, that the person actually fits in with your agency, with your people, with your style of working with clients, with your clients' styles and expectations. And again, all those things can be figured out in the interview process if we take the time. But what happens 
Let's talk about the barriers that get in the way of good hiring. And I'm gonna be truthful right now. You'll, you'll get to know me. I'm very authentic and sincere. We were impacted by the great resignation at, at Omnia. We had a few great people who did reevaluate and decide they wanted to go follow a lifelong passion. One person wanted to go back to school. One person decided to go work for his wife's nonprofit. So we've been impacted. We know what it, it feels like to have an empty seat. And it was painful. And so what happens, and I've been tempted to do it myself with barrier number one, is we compromise. We just need someone in that seat. We are losing money if we don't have a salesperson in that seat selling. So we get very, very tempted to cut corners. Um, we may not really think through what the hiring process needs to look like and be well thought out because we're just so desperate to get somebody in and we'll compromise. So like I said, Wendy's the one who solves all the problems in our organization. So Wendy, I'm going to show the barrier and turn it over to you for the solution. What would you recommend people do when we're when we're just tempted to compromise. And you know, we have been in that position before, of course. Um, and I think the key there is to make sure that you understand what your needs are and what your wants are. You know, what are the non-negotiables? So these are the skills I have to have. And if a candidate coming in doesn't have those skills, then you have to move on. Because I think a lot of times, and, and we've done it, you know, even in, the, in this business where it's like, okay, they don't have that one skill, but we can teach it. And then, you know, at that point now we're creating a lot of work for ourselves to try to bring that person up. And we've already got a learning curve as it is typically when you're bringing on a new person, right? There's just a natural learning curve. So the ideal thing to do is look at your job description, make sure you understand exactly what you have to have. And then you can have, well, here's the wish list. Here's what will be nice to have. But really knowing what you want, knowing what you need is key to not compromising and then make sure you stick to that list, of course, because it's going to be very tempting not to, especially if the person's nice and they, they seem like they have a good work ethic or maybe their assessment matches up to the job. But we want to, you know, we'll talk about that, all of the things that have to align to make that great hire. Right. And it's so true. You got to have that wish list. And every time you compromise, you're going to pay for it later. We've seen it. So <laughs> the next barrier is relying too much on our gut. And I am truly a person, a people person. So one of my struggles is once I find someone who I really like, who can convince me in the interview that they've done the job, I'm like, oh, they can do it. They can do it. And I might skip some corners on really making sure they can. So for example, you hire someone who's coming to you from a, a sales background and they're showing you all this experience of when they made the club and they got to go on the trip or they exceeded their quota by 110%. And you may go, okay, this person can sell, no problem, and stop asking the follow-up questions. You might find out that this person can sell, but they can really only sell to incoming leads. What if the job requires them to do cold calling or their own demand generation? So really making sure you don't just go on your gut or make those assumptions just because you think this person would be successful based on what you think sales looks like in your organization without really making sure they've done it. So I'm guilty of it. Wendy, what are some suggestions of making sure we, we, we really follow science and not our gut? I think we went back one. I did. I'm sorry about no, that. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> so, you know, um, I'm a data person as an analyst. Or, uh, it's all about the data that we can that we collect on a candidate and using everything at your disposal. So the interview is really important. Even your gut's important. It's just making sure that you're using all of the data to make the most objective decision. So if you're using, for example, assessments, that's important. But is it is it everything? And that's the thing is that when we're talking about people, there is no perfect solution. If there was, that would be a wonderful thing, but it never really happens that way. It's life, right? So if we're dealing with an imperfect world as we are, then the more information that we can collect, the more data that we can collect about an individual, about a candidate coming in, you know, their skills, their work ethic, the things that we get from the interview, the references, um, intelligence factors, maybe, you know, a cognitive tool. And then of course the behavioral piece that we, that we specialize in using all of that data will allow you to make the best possible decision. Will it be perfect every time? I'd love to say yes, but it's going to be perfect more often than not because you're using more data to make that decision. So it's, it's about information. 
information is key, right? Um, so I'm going to talk about personality data because that's where our expertise lies. And, and it, there's, you know, there's really a lot of, I think, sometimes mixed feelings out there about personality data. So I really do like to start with a personality tool measures key, you know, key traits on, on the behaviors, but it doesn't tell you the whole story. And again, that's what we were going back to is all of the data at your disposal, but it can help you so much because you are getting more insight than you would get Maybe you might need to work with somebody three, six months, even a year before you really have seen all of the information that a personality tool can tell you. It really helps you understand who you're getting so that you can make those more objective hiring decisions and then know what challenges you might be facing come, you know, with that person coming in. Because yes, you know, they've got all of these other things, so I'm going to go ahead and hire, but now I know where the weaknesses might be, and it just allows you to assess that fit. So here's the exciting part is we can go into the dimensions that we do measure, um, which are level of assertiveness. And this is everybody's favorite in the insurance agency world because this is where really you're going to see who are going to be hopefully your superstars in the producer roles. Because we're so great at measuring level of assertiveness, we have found time and time again that top producers have that strong level of assertiveness. And in the Omnia world, we show it in eight columns. So column one and two measure assertiveness. And when someone has a high column one, they're a naturally competitive, wind-driven person. The thing here is that they're comfortable taking risks. And that's what you want in a producer because you're really putting yourself out there. You're talking to strangers every day. You're negotiating. You're working under a quota. You're, you're living off of commission. That's somebody who's comfortable with risk. And that has been shown to really be the key personality driver in top producers. Now, I will say it doesn't mean that somebody that doesn't have a high level of assertiveness can't be successful, but we're playing the odds here. And if you want to have, you know, really consistent success, hiring somebody with a strong level of, of assertiveness is going to get you there. So when you've got somebody who has a low level of assertiveness, that's typically your risk averse personality type. That's a higher column two on the Omnia profile. And that's somebody who is cautious, team oriented, supportive, helpful. So you see them a lot in your customer service roles, especially if they don't have a lot of um, sales activities behind that role. And you'll see them in um, claims processing, service processing, administrative support, um, individual contributors that aren't responsible for um, revenue. So that's a really great trait for, in, like I said, in the agency world in particular. And then the next thing that we measure, the next dimension is communication style. And this is really about sociability. So everybody knows extrovert, introvert. So with the Omni assessment, it's social individuals versus analytical individuals. So your social, which we show in the tall column three, are people oriented, outgoing, you know, they never met a stranger. They are just energized by social contact. They tend to have a very persuasive communication style. This can be a great trait in sales. They um, also are great leaders, motivational, um, help desk support where they're really having to be very diplomatic. You know, did you plug in your computer? <laughs> Let's start there type of thing. And then we've got the analytics. So these are more socially reserved fact gatherers and they tend to really need a lot of proof and sort of logical thought process behind what they do and also can be great in sales and leadership roles. They just have a different sales style than the column three counterpart. So they're going to be really great at assessing needs, solving problems, and, and really coming at the, the sales process, for example, with a problem solving mindset. And both just need, you know, as you get a candidate coming in, if you've got a social producer, for example, then you know that it might, there might need to be some coaching on needs assessment and questioning tactics and vice versa with the, if you have an analytical, there might need to be some coaching in breaking the ice and maybe cold calling and sort of starting that relationship. So that's the great thing about the assessment is to understand where those strengths are and where those potential challenge areas might be. And then the next one that we measure is pace. And pace is really sort of patience versus impatience, right? So your tall column fives in the Omnia world are your fast paced multitasking individuals. They're very comfortable sort of starting something and then something else might take a, you know, oh, here we've got a new priority. I can stop what I'm doing, start this. And there's no feeling of um, getting flustered or overwhelmed by that. 
Whereas your column sixes in the Omni world, that's somebody who's very methodical, patient, one thing at a time. And in agency roles, typically the tall column fives are found in like that producer or sales manager, or maybe an account manager role. Whereas with the column sixes, account managers, CSRs, service processors, um, this is a great just to understand how they fit in with the pace of your agency and where you might need to um, try some different management tactics based on the pace of the individual. And then the last thing that we measure is need for structure. And this is really a great another one for producers. And this has been shown time and time again to be what we would consider the second most important ingredient in a successful salesperson. And that is a column seven, because this is where you get that resilience, that ability to brush off rejection, not let it get you down, not let it impact your confidence and move on to the next opportunity. So column sevens are independent. They're big picture oriented. They can make decisions with limited information and they let things slide off their back. So producers and managers are great agency roles with the tall column seven. The tall column eights are those individuals who do need a lot of structure. They're detailed, they're meticulous. They wanna be very procedural and follow the guidelines. So they're an excellent fit for customer service roles in an agency environment. Because here are the people who are you know, solving problems, maybe, you know, fixing data that was input wrong on, on maybe a different side of the equation. Um, so service support and individual contributors. So again, a great trait for that sales piece, which I know is so important in the agency world. I went through that very, very quickly. I get super excited about how that works. Um, and then we'll talk about, you know, comparing that to benchmarks. So where does this fit in in, in, in the world, right? And the first thing that we suggest that agencies do is either choose an industry benchmark because we do have a lot of data at our dis disposal at what's been successful, but also to perhaps look at how your top performers are doing because you might be in an area where um, maybe it's not strongly competitive and it's great to have somebody coming in with a book already or a lot of connections in the community and that's okay. So you can just go ahead and, and look at who's working for you and build a benchmark based on that. But the reason that we recommend benchmarking is to have a standard that works for you as, you know, as an agency, what's working. We look at your job description, we look at historical data, our research, we look at your top performers. The more data that we can use to create a benchmark, again, the better it will be to make sure that we're finding or helping you identify really the best talent for each position in the agency. I feel like I spoke like a thousand miles a minute. So. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all, Wendy. Thank you. So we talked about the importance of personality. Let's get into some of the other key things that are important in the in the hiring process. And the third barrier that we do see is inconsistency. And again, we can all fall prey to this if we're not careful. Again, truth. I just literally forgot to look at someone's LinkedIn profile recently, and I always look at the LinkedIn profile. So even if you have a documented process, it's a challenge sometimes to not be to not follow it. But we really do believe that it's got to be consistent and you can get into trouble if it's not as well. I mean, there are all sorts of risks for your agency if you're not uh, showing the same openness and fairness to every single candidate. So um, but again, that time pressure can get in the way or people not being available, perhaps. Again, calendars get tight. Lots of reasons why we don't follow a consistent process. So we do recommend having one documented. And then I'll go one step further and suggest that you make yourself a checklist so you know that you've done those things that you're supposed to do. That's my new note to self. Um, but what we recommend as a solution is to really have a consistent process and to use the same people and processes in, the, in it if you can. Uh, it should always include some sort of pre-screen. Uh, that's where you're questioning fit. Is the pay right? Does this person understand the job? Are you getting a sense of why they'd want the job? And then having more formalized process questions, uh, pre-planned questions as you go through it. So while you're looking at the resume, that's when you'll review again, what did you say you needed? What are the qualifications? How do you make sure that person's you know, checking off all those boxes? And then of course we recommend doing an assessment, using science and using data to see if the person actually fits with the job. 
And beyond personality fit, there are all sorts of assessments out there. We also offer cognitive and grammar assessments that make sure the person can actually communicate effectively to a client and that they've got the necessary uh, critical thinking skills to do the job. And then also there are all sorts of assessments you might want to try and make sure that they know Microsoft or typing or any of those things. So definitely testing and not just assuming the person has the job, has the skills. And then the interview process, um, really making sure that you factor in what you're looking for into the types of questions you want. And this is where consistency is key again, using the same interview questions for every single person. And then don't skip the reference check, really finding out has this person, you know, fit well in an organization that looks like yours, asking those tough questions, you know, does this person receive feedback well? When did they have a challenge they had to overcome? Getting that information. Uh, really from, from some people who have experienced this person is another great set. So again, our recommendation is to have a consistent process and then follow the process. And then you wanna make sure, again, you're consistent in it with the people. So for every process, figure out how, how many interviews are we going to do, write it down, who's going to be involved prepping those questions, uh, especially if you've got people in the process that we talked about who might be more reserved or cautious, but it's really critical that they're involved in the hiring, give them some warm up questions, give them some opening uh, and help them, you know, be, make it easier for them to conduct that interview because it might not be something they do on a regular basis. Make sure that you incorporate those workplace and culture questions into the interview, along with specific behaviorally based questions. Now, when you use Omnia for your selection, you do get interview questions that we recommend you ask. So you can incorporate those naturally into your interview. Um, we also recommend though, that you create ones that are specific to the scenarios within your agency. And we call those behaviorally based interview questions. We can help you develop those if you, if you ever would like assistance, but it's when you really give the person a scenario and you ask for them to tell you a time in their past where they personally were involved in a similar scenario and how they got through it. What did they do behaviorally to work through the situation and what was the outcome? So really important to include those. And then we're a big fan of simulations. If you can simulate what a really important aspect of the job is, then have the person simulate that activity in the interview process. So if they have to cold call, have them cold call you or have them leave you a voicemail. If they have to make presentations, create a, a very simple presentation format for them to present. If they have to write, give them a writing prompt or a presentation prompt for them to create a visual for you. Being able to actually see what the person's work output will look like will give you a lot of good understanding of whether or not the person's gonna actually be able to do the job. So let's move to our next poll. Our first question is, do you usually, do you already use assessments in your selection process? We're curious to see how many of you are using science already. And that is great. We are seeing a, a good bit of you saying yes. And then some of you may be considering it for the first time or haven't, haven't thought of it. And maybe there's a new idea here today. Great. Our next question, especially for those using assessments, have you ever assessed the traits of your top performers and come up with a benchmark or what a successful profile looks like? Great, a little more balanced here. Looks like fewer of you have done that benchmarking, but, but again, a good bit of you have done that, which again, it's always a good idea. If you can see what success already looks like in your agency, and, and then use that in your hiring process to measure it, it's great. So for those of you who haven't done that yet, we hope you'll consider it after today's session. And then training staff, just curious, have any of you conducted formal training for your staff on how to conduct an effective interview? Might be something you just haven't considered. And I would wonder, you know, how many of you are involving your staff in those interviews and how comfortable are they? Or um, the kinds of interview questions, have you, have you written them and trained staff on how to get to specific behaviorally based interview questions versus just going with that gut or asking the, the traditional questions? We just wrote a blog on like, what are the top five interview questions? And 
people get really good at answering those top five. So when you train, you can really think through what questions are going to make the most sense, who should ask them, and then teaching people what to look for in those answers really helps. So, so great. Thanks for that input. Thanks again, Joseph, for helping us manage that poll. And so I'm going to, oops, I'm got, there we go. Oops. I don't know what just happened there. So bear with me. I'm going to go through these slides. And I'm turning it over to Wendy on some final summary of the best practices. Sorry about that, Wendy. No, that's fine. That's fine. Yes. Yeah, so, I need um, training on slide <laughs> navigation in Canva. <laughs> I think that um, that arrow was just going on its own. Um, so yeah, the best hiring practices, I think, you know, like we were talking about, because we're talking about people and, and there's just so many facets to, to who we are as people, right? What, what makes us who we are, what makes us good at our jobs or passionate about what we do. So it's so important that we're looking at, at everything. You know, of course we specialize in a behavioral assessment, but we really do want to tell people that it should be 20 to 25% of your overall hiring decision. There's so many other things that have to play into that. So looking at hiring like a pie, we want to look at the interview impression. I mean, there's nothing that beats the interview. We, we do need to have that face to face and talking to somebody, um, you know, sort of seeing how they respond to questions and looking them in the eye. Hopefully it's probably a video interview nowadays, but you know that it's still super important and, and figuring out if this person meshes with your culture. Um, has the skills that you're looking for, can answer those questions, super important. Background testing, of course, um, looking at someone's social media, that's a big thing now, like we, you know, Heather was talking about earlier, LinkedIn, and I have to say, Heather, because I forgot, of course, the one person, we actually have a checklist, and we both forgot to look at that LinkedIn, so, um, you know, looking at that is, is super important, especially for certain roles, and, you know, maybe an IT position, not so much, but in a marketing role, you want to see it, you know, you want to see a healthy LinkedIn profile. Um, education, work experience, technical skills, all super important. And then, of course, references. And, and sometimes it can be challenging to get a lot of information from references, but we've had great success. Um, you know, it's not 100% of the time, like, like we're talking about, nothing is perfect. But when we get references who talk, it's really great to, to get that piece. Um, so when you really are thinking about hiring, it's everything factors into making the best possible decision. And when we miss a step, you know, we, we feel it down the road. So hopefully we don't miss a step. And so the process, this is a visual representation of the process that we were talking about earlier. And, you know, there's going to be certain details within that that you'll add that's perfect for you. So establishing your selection criteria, what works best for you, what are, what are your must haves, what are your nice to haves. And then that way you can screen those resumes according to those lists. Um, and then we recommend a phone screening, especially for a lot of positions where you've got people who are going to be talking to your customers on the phone. It's a great starting point. And then it also doesn't spend that excess time. And you can get a lot of hard questions out of the way, too, to make sure that everybody's aligning with expectations and even salary expectations in the front end can sometimes be a positive thing. Um, and then there are the assessments, the interviews themselves, references, and then the offer. Wendy, I'm going to take this question right now. Robert is yep. asking or, or mentioning that some recruiting companies are suggesting not to do the assessment until later in the process. And so I, we have a point of view about the timing of that assessment. Do you want to speak to that? Yeah, um, you know, so I think it's important to look at the assessment results after the initial interview or after the phone screen, because you really do want to start to formulate your your concerns, your first impressions, everything that might that you might want to ask down the road. And the thing that I like about the assessment is then you can see if any of that is, is solidified in what you were thinking. And also I've heard a lot of our clients say, you know, there was something that I just couldn't put my finger on, but then when I looked at the assessment, it was like, aha, that's something I need to examine further. Um, but one of the things about assessments is that it's actually ideal to give it in the very early stages. So we suggest that you give the assessment before you do anything else. So, you know, if you like the resume, you send the assessment, but you don't have to, at least with Omnia, you don't have to process the assessment. You can hold it 
and then wait until you're ready to move them to the next step after you've had the phone screen, for example, and then you can look at those, you know, order those results and take a look at them. So you're giving it before they've got a lot of preconceived notions or they're maybe swayed by things that you've said. So you've got the cleanest possible time to give it and then you don't have to look at it until or, you know, order it and look at it until after um, the best part of your step. So I would suggest after the phone screen or first interview. Great, thanks, Wendy. And thanks for the yeah. question, Robert. So Joseph put in the uh, chat line that we are giving an offer for everyone to try it out. Like, we, like he said in the beginning, it can be very useful insight. If you've never taken it, uh, it will give you some helpful insight into your style, uh, your, your leadership style is, is the one that we're offering here. So please take us up on it. And then we will also answer any questions you may have. And there is my contact info if you have any specific follow-up questions you want to chat about after this is over. But uh, we'll open it up to questions. Absolutely. Kether, Wendy, thank you so much for sharing this presentation. I am so excited to now have our relationship with you where CWC member agencies can work with you in your great program. You have many different types of programs. Can you just kind of explain how you know basic it can be to even how customized it can be? You guys really, because let's just be honest, some people are asking how you compare to other companies. I'm not going to name the other companies because there, there's just other companies out there. There's lots of different assessment companies. One thing that really sets y'all apart is the ability to customize the experience. It's not cookie cutter. Y'all, and I'll just be blunt. I'll be blunt. We stopped using that company several years ago, and I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. I almost didn't hire Beth Lambrecht because of it. For those of you in our program, know who Beth is. Beth averaged 133 policies sold a month last year. She wrote 170 something in January. She's already at 50 something in February. She's been with us for eight years. Beth score told me not to hire her. See, that's why the lady said in that pie chart, the, the assessments is just 25% of the consideration roughly. I'm doing that from memory, but I almost didn't hire her because of that. And I'll wake up just about every morning. And I thank the good Lord that Beth Lambert still wanted to do insurance, even though I politely told her, I don't think that you're good fit even though I liked her but she didn't pass the personality assessment and we were holding it as bible right that's just the way we did it back then I'm so thankful that she wanted to do insurance she went out and got her own insurance license went to work at a little agency down the street from us for about six months then she reached back out to me and I said well heck she's licensed now I'll give her a shot <laughs> first month 54 items and then within a year and a half she was writing 100 items a month she has not written 100 items in a month probably more than five times in the past six years. Mm -hmm. But her personality assessment from that other company, the cookie cutter company, told me not to hire her. So believe it or not, we canceled that program and haven't really used assessment since until, until my good friend, Laura Harris, right? Laura referred us to Omnia. For those of you with Allstate, you know who Laura Harris is, one of the most well-respected agents in the country. She got us connected with Omnia. I, I took a look at what they did. And y'all take the example leadership survey. Take the example leadership survey. I'm curious, by the way, would anybody want to see mine? Send me a chat. Does anybody want to see mine? Come on. Nobody want to see mine? Okay, sure. Yes. Okay, yeah, sure. Some you, know what? you know what? I'm going to take over. I'm going to take over. I just decided to do this while you were talking. Y'all, this is mine. Now, I'm not an expert at reading these reports, and I'm really putting myself out there. Wendy or Kether could look at this and be like, oh, my God, Craig Wiggins, you need to fire this guy. I don't know. But this is my <laughs> leadership report from when I met with the ladies in the fall, and we started crafting our relationship. I don't really know what all these numbers mean, Wendy or Kether, but hopefully I'm a good leader. But you can see how detailed and oriented. So I have lots of call tall first columns, which I, if I remember from your presentation, Wendy, that means I'm probably going to be a good leader. Yeah, Beautiful. Absolutely. And if I scroll down, there's all kinds of more data on my leadership style. Uh, it really is explaining who I am. Y'all are probably taking screenshots of this right now and probably <laughs> analyzing me tonight as you guys are taking screenshots. Look how thorough this report is. This is just one example of what Omnia can do. Omnia can customize your reports. They can do all kinds of things for you. 
but man, I asked the question, but then I started giving the answer. <laughs> Ladies, I'll pass it to you. Can you just talk about how you're different from anybody else that's out there? And I'm going to stop sharing and let's just keep our faces big for now. People got the website. Maybe we can share the slide at the end, but let's keep our faces bigger for our conversation. What sets y'all apart from anybody else out there? I'll, I'll jump right in without a doubt. And Wendy, I think would say the same exact thing. It's our service. We have, we've been in business for 36 years and our average tenure on our customer success team is averages of above 10, 12 years. Um, so we're committed to our clients. Uh, you are going to talk to the people who write the surveys, customize the surveys. Um, you know, Wendy is available to anyone who wants to chat and she's the, you know, has been with the company almost since its inception. So not, she's not quite that old, but <laughs> she's been around a long time. So we really pride ourselves in that hands-on service and dedication to our clients and that customized experience all through. If, if you're not getting value out of it, we definitely want to talk to you and, and want to make it right. And we will. So that's one of our big differentiators. And then I would also say is we, our primary business is insurance. So um, we have run tens of thousands of these reports for every role in an insurance agency. We understand the insurance market. Um, like Wendy said, throughout discussing the personalities, we know what personality is needed in those various roles in your agency and feel very confident that our benchmarks are certain. And then if you've got unique roles, we have a process to make sure it's, it's customized to your unique profiles of your, of your top performers. So. Wendy, what that else would you say? Is fantastic. Just to, just to be clear, could y'all imagine taking like your top performers assessment, letting them know that's more what you're looking for, and then they can customize that for you? I don't know anybody else that does that. Before I pass it back to Wendy, Debbie Frazier said, our firm loves working with Omnia, the customization of the assessments to align with the specific positions and gracious and attentive customer service are outstanding. So you have a raving fan in Debbie, but Wendy, Thank go you, ahead. Debbie. You know, what I think is so important is that we really try to keep it realistic for clients too, because I do think that there's, you know, and, and not, I think there are a lot of places out there that say that this is the end all be all. And where we really want to say that it fits into a process, it fits into a lot of information that you have to gather, gather, excuse me, that came out with an accent. Um, so if you're just relying on one tool, you know, that's not, it's never the way to go. You know, that's just not how life works. And we really try to make sure that everybody understands that we aren't saying that this is the end all be all. But what we are saying is that when you use it, you're going to have better odds and better success. But we're people, we're human beings. So there are going to be individuals out there who have a profile or, you know, a personality type that's atypical for sales that we wouldn't typically recommend. But if that person has the heart, the passion, the drive, the work ethic to, to work against their natural grain and get it done, that's great. But how often does that happen? It's, it's rare. So that's why, you know, an assessment tool is so great because it is going to allow you to, to assess that. And that's where the interview comes into play. Because if you find somebody that you feel is going to get it done, despite maybe the fact that they're going to work outside of their comfort zone every day. And that's also something to be aware of, because when you have somebody who's working outside of their comfort zone, they might burn out easier, for example. And so as a leader, you still want that information so that you can keep an eye on that. And if you've got somebody who's great, who isn't maybe a natural fit, there might be some things that you can do as a leader to make them you know, more comfortable and, and really decrease that chance for burnout. Well, it's exciting that many people watching this call are already a part of your program. Andrew mm -hmm. Aubrey said, we use Omnia, love it, but I'd like customization for my reports if someone can contact me. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if y'all can jot that down or something. I did. I already wrote state. it down, Andrew. Okay, good. So, <laughs> yep. you know, people are asking about costs and various mm -hmm. things. You have different packages, different levels. Really, they should get started with their free assessment, right, online to check that out. Your team will then follow up to talk about their needs. They might yeah. have a situation where they're okay with kind of the, I hate to use the word term cookie cutter, but like the standard things, mm -hmm. but they might determine, you and your team might determine that they need more customization. You guys can really roll up your sleeves and get to work and put something together for them. That of course is going to vary, but what I'll tell y'all is an investment in a great program to make sure that you're making great decisions on hiring, but also y'all, this is a powerful tool for your existing staff. 
your existing staff to, to learn and understand, are they in the right role? Are they in the right seats on the bus? Right? Do they have potential to grow within the agency? Or are they happy where they are now? This isn't just a recruiting tool. This is meant for the whole office to utilize. And you'll be surprised at your results. My good friend, Aaron Augustine in Texas said he did his Omnia several years ago and it was spot on. It was spot on. So really cool. A um, couple other questions here. Let's see here. Um, you see the one from you, Tyler, Joseph? Yes. I, okay, good. I, he's been very yeah. patient. Uh, with I want to save to that one because it's a loaded okay. one. We'll do that one next. Um, okay. Let's do this. Does your Does your platform store their data and information? Like, is it easy to navigate existing candidates or existing profiles? And also, do y'all do anything with job postings and, and stuff? Another vendor does job postings. I'm not sure if y'all do that as well, or it's just the assessments. Wendy, I'll turn that over to you. So um, we do have sort of a, what I call miniature applicant tracking system because it is really, um, it was created for smaller agencies that you know don't want to use one of those giant, expensive, robust ATS systems. And we do have job, you know, you can link up your postings to Indeed. Um, and then we also have a job posting writing service because there is a little, you know, there's sometimes a little psychology to that too. So making sure that we're hitting those keywords for you know getting the right personality type. So you don't, you know, you want to start with your ad to make sure that you're not attracting a very cautious risk averse person in a role where you need somebody very assertive and wind driven. So we have the job ad writing service and then we also have the ATS that can post through Indeed. Fantastic. Let's get to the big one. So Tyler asked the question that probably all of y'all want to ask. With this incredibly fast pace of hiring, and y'all, it's never been harder to hire people. Let's just throw that out there. I've been doing this now for 13 years. Many of y'all have been doing it for way, way longer. This is a very unique situation. And, you know, just to be quite honest, remote is going to be an expectation. Remote is going to be a thing. That's why last year for CWC members, Justin Slocum did three training sessions, three webinars on how he manages his remote team. And he's crushing it. Like he is one of the largest agencies in the country. We're going to be doing more remote training in April. The ladies will be back from Omnia. They'll be back with us to share lots of great things about remote. But Tyler, I feel you, man. I feel your pain in your paragraph, right? Saying it's a hard time to hire right now. I'm conducting the phone screen. The candidate replies. They're going to come to the interview. Half of them don't even show up, right? They ghost you. Half of them don't even show up. Um, they're getting offers from other companies quicker who aren't making them jump through all these hoops. I get all that. I get all that. Heather, excuse me, Kether, Wendy, what would y'all say to Tyler and to others about hiring in this difficult environment? Is it still important to have tools and resources like this now, especially as we're trying to evaluate the very slim pickings? We got some slim pickings, right? There's way more job openings than there are candidates right now. What would y'all say to Tyler and to other agents that honestly probably have the same question? I mean, it's such a great concern. And I think that's why, like for Omnia, at least, we really try to make the user experience as quick as possible. So our assessment only takes 10 minutes. So it really shouldn't put a kink in the selection process, which we do know some assessments out there take an hour, hour and a half. And, you know, I get that that's putting them through a lot of hoops. So the great thing is that our tool is very quick. And then our turnaround time is also quick. So with the online versions, you can have instant results. With our custom tool, it's three hours. So it's still, you know, it's still pretty fast. <laughs> well, I think that's very fast, but yeah. So we really try to think about the user experience and make sure that that's, um, you know, not going to get in the way, the assessment piece. Yeah, and I still and think some, it's super important. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I do as well. Something that I would add, y'all, is when it's tough to hire, we definitely got to make sure that we're making the right decision. Here's the thing. I, I consult with about 50 agencies personally. I work with about 50 agencies twice a month, coaching and, and, and training their team. It's fantastic. I love it. I literally do six to seven, sometimes eight Zoom sessions a day. And sometimes I'll talk with an owner who's desperate to hire. Y'all, I used to work at a bank. I used to work at a bank. Try getting money when you need it. <laughs> See, the bank can sense. Hold on a second. This guy needs money. I'm not going to give him money. You get credit when you don't need it, right? Similar to staffing, when you're desperate to hire and desperate to fill a seat, right? We make poor decisions. Let's be slow to hire, quick 
to hold them accountable if they're not the right fit, meaning fire, right? Slow to hire, quick to fire if they're not the right fit, train them, train them. And for those of you that are CWC members, you are so fortunate and blessed to be in our program because you can leverage the training that we provide as a benefit of being a part of your agency. That's huge, right? Most other agencies and many other companies have terrible training and you can provide fantastic training to help them excel in their role. That's a huge benefit. Should you evaluate compensation plans and how you incentivize your team? Should you consider things that will attract and retain talent like benefits and things like that? Yes. Y'all, we can no longer just pay people $11 an hour and expect them to come and sell 60 policies a month for us. We don't have time to get into that can of worms today. We did a webinar last month on creating compensation plans. It's in our platform in the 2021, excuse me, 2022 owners and manager section, 2022 owners and manager section. We did that. And Craig, Allison, and I, along with a couple other guests, talked about how we need to revamp compensation plans to attract and retain talent. But I just want to say that, y'all, please don't be desperate to hire. Even if you need somebody, don't just rush to put cheeks in the seat. Excuse my French, that's, that's a weird term. I know I just said cheeks in the seat. And I joke with <laughs> owners who say, I'm just desperate to hire. I said, man, I'll come up there. I'll come up there and sit and work. I'll, I'll warm your seat for you. No, be slow to hire, make the right decision using great tools like this. Give them world-class training from CWC and hopefully they work out. But if they don't, get them out quickly. Seriously, you're still gonna make poor hires. You're still going to have some that slip through the cracks, but if you can make fewer, it will save you thousands. You will save thousands of dollars by making better hires. Do we have any other questions at this time? And while we're waiting to see if there's any more questions, Kether, Wendy, do you have any maybe kind of final parting thoughts? If you want to share your contact information again, is that able yep. to pull up that last slide one more yep, time? Sure thing. And I would encourage y'all take the assessment. Take the assessment. You saw me skim through mine. It was really eye-opening as I was studying it. And I was almost afraid to send it to Craig. I was like, am I still good? But Craig read it and studied it. The, the ladies told me that I was okay. Take yours. Take yours. And then, of course, their team will reach out to you to see if you have any other questions, to see about how maybe they can help you help you out. Make sure that you go through the link that slash Craig Wiggins Coaching. That way they know you're a part of our program. There's exclusive pricing just for y'all. Just FYI. But ladies, I, I believe that we're okay with questions. Do y'all have any final thoughts for the attendees and for those watching the recording? I'd like to say thank you. Thank you for your participation and the great questions. And again, Tyler, we can feel your pain, but don't compromise. Use a pro Follow a process, use a process, and use the science. So thank you all. We're really looking forward to meeting you all and continuing to connect with you on these webinars. So thanks for having us, Joseph. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Wendy, any final thoughts from you? Second, everything that Kather said. And, you know, of course, the, the thing about compromising is when we do it, it's going to hurt worse. <laughs> All mm -hmm. right. So, um, yeah, following Good that stuff. process. Well, I appreciate you all so much for taking time out of your day to work with us. Consider reaching out to Omnia to see what they can do to help you with your current team and your recruiting. But now it is time to get off this call and get back to work, y'all. We've got policies to write, people to protect, team members to develop. Okay. Let's get back to work, y'all, working towards exceeding your goals. We still have a lot of time left in this very short month. Let's hit it hard, y'all. Crush your goals and feel free to reach out to me if I can help you with anything at all. Joseph at CraigWigginsCoaching.com. With that said, our friends at Omnia and here at Craig Wiggins Coaching, thank you. Now back to work. We'll see y'all next time. Bye-bye.